During the past two months, we've been discussing a personal dilemma that most of us have found ourselves in at one time or another. And it's uh, the personal dilemma that's described in Galatians 5 and 17. If you would look at it, Galatians 5 and 17. Many of you will recognize the verse when we read it. Galatians 5.17, and it's page 1015, the ones in that black, RSV, 1015, Galatians 5 and 17. And whether you were a Christian or not a Christian, I think we find ourselves experiencing this. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you would. And most of us have experienced a desire inside us to be patient and another desire inside us to lose our temper. And most of us have experienced a desire inside to be open and loving towards our friends and towards those in our home. But there's been inside us another kind of resentful, withdrawing spirit that fought against the good spirit. And most of us after fighting this for a number of years, at last compromise with it. And we rationalize that most human beings experience this battle inside. And of course we use old Paul's words in Romans 7 to reinforce that belief that that's the normal life of a human being. That uh, the good that we would we cannot do and the evil we want to avoid, that's the very thing we do. And so we battle with a thing for a number of years and then we decide we can't take it any longer. This is just it. This is the way life is and we decide just to grin and bear it and accept it. And of course, this book is just absolutely opposite to that viewpoint. This book says that there is no doubt at all that God himself has dealt with that problem and has already destroyed it and that there is no reason on earth or in heaven why we should continue to have to fight it. And uh, you remember uh, God said it plainly in Romans 6 and verse 6, if you look at it there, Romans 6 and verse 6, page 981. Romans 6 and verse 6. We know that our old self, and it's the old self that gets angry and gets impatient. It's the old self-attitude, the self-love and the self-centeredness that continues to give us trouble. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. We saw last week, you remember, that our place is not to try to destroy this thing but to see that it has already been destroyed by a supernatural force that it is greater than ours. And our place is to do what we're advised in Romans 6 and 11 there. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And the King James Version has the well-known word reckon, you know. You also must reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And uh, the word, you remember, is lagidseste. And uh, it means to treat yourself as actually being dead to sin and dead to those things. You remember that we felt last Sunday that one of the vital factors in reckoning was that you kept your eyes on what God said had happened rather than keeping your eyes on what you yourself were experiencing. You remember we said that it was vital to believe what God said had happened to your old self which got angry and got envious and got impatient rather than to introspect at your own jealousy and your own pride. And many of us, of course, have no chance of coming into deliverance from self-love and from self-will because we keep on looking in, looking in, looking in. And... uh, Romans 6 and 6 says, we know that our old self was crucified with Christ. And we say, no, when I look in at my own miserable moral impotence, I know that I have not been crucified with Christ. And God says, you have to reckon yourself dead with Christ, however you feel like inside. And we said that that was a vital step in reckoning, 
believing that what God said had happened had actually happened, however much your own personal experience seemed to contradict it. We said that it was vital that there should be that leap if God was to make it actual in your own life. You remember we used the illustration of the old water skis. And uh, I know, I hope, don't, uh, there was a great group went out water skiing last Sunday after the illustration. So you don't need to go out water skiing. If you just try it itself in your own life, that would do it. But uh, you remember, use the illustration about water skiing. That uh, you, the instructor, your dad or your friend, says, okay, all you have to do, flex the legs a bit, hold on to the rope, and just, just stay there. Just like that. And the boat will do the rest. And uh, you do that, and one ski's going that way, and the other ski's going that way, and the water is filling your mouth, and the spray's in your eyes, and yet, he says, you have to reckon that what I said will happen. Even though all the facts that you're experiencing are very real, the water is getting into your eyes, the legs are going in different directions, and your arms are pulling out of their sockets, yet, despite all those very real facts, facts as real as anger and envy and jealousy, despite those very real facts, you're to reckon that what I said is true. This will happen. If you stick with it, you'll come up on top of the surface of the water. And you know what happens. That you keep on reckoning that. Maybe it takes you two or three falls to really believe it. But you keep on reckoning it and believing that what he said is true. And eventually you come up onto the surface of the water for at least 30 seconds anyway. Now, that's what we, where we got to last Sunday, the ones. That reckoning meant believing that what a person said was going to happen was going to happen. Now, there's a second factor in reckoning that we broached last Sunday but didn't deal in detail with. Reckoning means not only believing that what he said is true, but treating yourself as if it is true, behaving as if it is true, putting yourself in a position that is only bearable if what he said actually happens. So let's imagine that your dad or your friend have instructed you, this is what you have to do. He gets into the boat, takes her out a bit, and you stand on the shore, on the skis, looking. And he comes back and says, don't you believe me? And you say, yeah, yeah, I do, but I'm going to believe myself onto the water without doing anything myself. I'm just going to stand here and believe myself onto the water without holding onto the rope. And he mumbles something about basket work and goes away to find somebody who's sane and who will really do what he says. In other words, there's no point in saying you believe it unless you get on the skis, get into the water and hold on to the rope. You treat yourself as if you're actually in the position that he describes. You put yourself in a position that is only bearable if what he said actually comes about. Now that's what reckoning is. And actually, it's interesting, the instructor will use the same words as uh, this verse that we're studying uh, today. Uh, if you look at the verse uh, first, maybe uh, it would be wise. Romans 6 and 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Some of us feel, oh, you're just playing an auto-suggestion game on yourself. You have to reckon that you're dead with Christ. You have to reckon that You've been crucified with him. You have to reckon that you have no right to any reputation as he has. And then you mean you just exercise your own power over jealousy and pride. It's just a mind game you're playing. But loved ones, in skiing it isn't that. The instructor says, okay, you sit there, you, you stand on the skis, you flex the legs, you hold the rope, and you just stay like that and lean back and lie back into it and let the boat take you up. And that's what God says. Let not sin reign over you. He says, the power that will destroy anger and jealousy in you is the power that destroyed it in Jesus 1900 years ago. And that power is released in your life whenever you treat yourself as having been crucified. But it is not your own auto-suggestion that overcomes the anger and jealousy. It is the boat that takes you up. It is the power of the boat that takes you up. You just lean back. You just put yourself in the right attitude and the power of the boat takes you up onto the surface of the water. It's the same with deliverance from selfish will. It is not auto-suggestion, loved ones. 
It isn't saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm crucified with Christ, therefore that's right. I conclude that I have no right to be proud. Okay, I'm not going to be proud. It isn't that. It's putting yourself in the right attitude and the power that was released upon your anger in Jesus is released upon it in your own life. But the power of God is only attached to your life when you do what God said has happened. Treat yourself as really having been crucified. To really a wee bit like a space capsule coming back into the Earth's atmosphere. It's not the space capsule that gets itself into the Earth's atmosphere. It's the gravity of the Earth. It just draws it. The space capsule doesn't have to try hard. It just falls. But they have to get it into the right attitude before it enters the Earth's atmosphere. Now that's what God is saying. You have to get yourself into the right position, into the right attitude in regard to the fact that you've been crucified with Christ, and then when you've done that, the power of that crucifixion will be released upon your own problems and upon your own selfish will. And that's really what reckoning means. And of course, Satan's job is to keep us from ever getting into that right attitude. It's his job to keep us from seeing where we're letting sin reign in our mortal bodies. It's his job to keep us from that, from seeing that. And of course, he has one great advantage. For years, our mortal bodies have been used to behaving in a certain way, in response to self and in response to trying to live our own lives without a loving father. In other words, every time we saw the bank account go down, we've been used to the old body pumping in the adrenaline and worrying the whole night and losing half a night's sleep. So, we've been used to sin reigning in our mortal bodies. Sin is Satan's power and influence to live as if there's no loving father in charge. And self is the desire for our own way and to be our own God that opens the way for sin to reign in our lives. And for years, you see, we've been living that way. For years we've been used, immediately a person insulted us, we've been used to a reflex reaction taking place in our mind, our emotions, and in our body, and in our glands, and we've been used to bursting with anger, and retorting and responding with caustic comments. So that's one of the things that makes it difficult for God to show us in what way our attitude is not that of one who is crucified with Christ. Because for years our mortal bodies have been used to not being crucified with Christ, to feeling that we had to fight our own corner every day in life. So one of the great things that the Holy Spirit is to do among us is what an, a ski instructor does, tell us in what way our position is wrong, in what way our attitude is wrong. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. His job is to show you and me where sin is still reigning in our mortal bodies, where there's an attitude of independence to God in our own lives. For instance, you normally go to bed at 11 o'clock. You normally get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, 7 hours sleep. You have decided 7 hours sleep is your minimum. You've read all the Reader's Digest articles on how to do without sleep, and you've resolved 7 hours is what you need. You're out late one night. You don't come in till 12.30. You're one and a half hours short. Still, you have to get up at 6 in the morning. So you get up at 6, feeling, well, I normally need seven hours. This is going to be a rough day for me. <laughs> and as the day goes on, and you feel a little tendency of the old body to do what it always does, get more and more irritable, and more and more tense as the day goes on, because it hasn't had its normal rest, so you almost come to the place near the end of the day where you actually expect to get irritable. You almost get to the point where you expect people to make allowances for you because after all you're one and a half hours short of the magic number and anybody who hasn't had enough sleep has certainly a right just to be, well, a little touchy anyway. And you see, we provide for sin. So by the time it comes eight or nine o'clock at night, we're providing for sin right down the line. We don't expect anything different. Now, what the Holy Spirit wants to show us in regard to a thing like that, and that's only one of the many situations, is you don't get the one and a half hour sleep. But he wants you to see that that old body, that belonged to that old self, that used to get tired after 
a certain number of hours had passed, that that old body that was used to seven hours sleep minimum has been crucified with Jesus. That God destroyed it, destroyed the old self, destroyed the whole personality, and started the whole thing over again new. And that you at this moment have the body of Jesus available to you, a new fresh body that never gets tired, that runs and does not weary, that walks and does not faint. A body that is able to do all things through Christ that strengthens it. And you breathe in and out that life of Jesus throughout the day. And loved ones, the miracle is the Holy Spirit destroys that irritability and fills you with a freshness and a newness right up to the moment you have to go to bed. Now, loved ones, that's the difference in attitude, you see. The power is the same power that destroyed the old self on the cross. It's that power that destroys the impotence of the moral will. It's that power that destroys the weakness of the tired body. And it's that power also that makes available the life of Jesus to us. Different situation. You go home. You, your roommate is there. Or your dad is there. Your mum, your brother, or sister. You have made supper four nights in a row. Straight. Which is, I think, worthy of the purple cross, at least. Yeah. <laughs> purple heart. The Victoria Cross in Britain was the purple heart. And you've done four nights in a row. And you come home. And the roommate is lying flat out watching TV. And uh, you summon up all your patience and you say, would you help me to make supper? She doesn't even speak. At that moment, you know that you're about to be walked over. This girl is just going to be walked back and forward over you like a doormat. Or dad, you're going to be walked back and forward over again by that, that wife of yours. Or son or daughter, you're going to be walked over. These parents of yours are just making use of you. And you begin to feel, I'm, if I don't defend myself, they're going to use me. I, I'm just going to be made use of. I'm going to be a maid or I'm going to be a manservant to this person all my life. And the old anger and the old adrenaline is pumped in and the old blood supply is increased. And before you know it, you've just burst out in a tirade that sets the course for that evening for the next ten evenings. Until eventually you both get tired of the Cold War. Now, loved ones... Do you see that what the Holy Spirit is saying through this verse, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. That verse is saying, you ask the person to help you make supper. There's no answer. Then at that moment, you look up and you see that the old self that always needed to be defended lest people make use of it, that that old self that used to have to watch in case other people put it down too often or used it too much, that that old self was crucified with Jesus. That as Jesus was willing to be treated unjustly on Calvary and yet to give out continual love, so you were crucified with Jesus on Calvary and you have died and your right to respond to that person in an irritable way has died, your right to defend yourself and make sure that you're not used too much by other people, that has gone. And like Jesus, you lie down in the tomb and you give up consciousness and you trust that Father of yours absolutely to raise you by his own power in his own time when it pleases him. And you give the whole business of your relationship with your friend and your reputation and the way they're going to treat you for the rest of your life. You give that all over to God and you say, thank you, Father, that you crucified all that with Jesus. Thank you that you crucified every right and every need I had to defend myself or to defend the way people were treating me. And Father, I thank you for the life of Jesus. And Lord Jesus, I trust you now to pour into me and pour in in love and in patience so that I enjoy making this supper this evening. But loved ones, that is letting sin not reign in your mortal bodies. The other approach is providing for sin. In other words, the second part of reckoning is don't provide for sin. Don't look at yourself as alive, still having to guard your little position. Regard yourself as having been crucified with Jesus and give God the right to look after you and to defend you. And brothers and sisters, believe me, 
he will not ask you to bear more than you're able to bear. And he'll call off the hounds before they've torn you apart. He will. God is faithful. He has promised he will not quench a flickering torch. He will pull the thing off before it kills you. But do you see, it is not our right to provide for that independence which sin is. It's only our right to let the power of Jesus work in us and to put ourselves in positions that are only bearable if his power does work. Loved ones, any questions? And I know some... Brother... Yes, brother, uh, brother says, how would a Christian show love to that person lying down uh, flat out watching TV? It seems to me vital to ask. It seems to me vital to ask. I don't think you just uh, encourage them in their laziness because obviously they have to learn something too. It's vital to ask them and request them to do it. Then, brother, it's vital, and husbands and wives, you who are married, you know this is true. It's vital then, brother, to accept their answer, unfair if it is, but to accept it, to forget it, to turn away from it, to turn away from your need to make sure that the responsibilities are evenly distributed in the apartment and to receive from Jesus the life that will enable you to do it with joy and with love. Before you know it, when you're beginning to look at them with a clear heart and really love them with absolutely no reservations, the Holy Spirit begins to shine light into their hearts and you begin to find them becoming aware of their own laziness. But brother, I'm convinced that's the way the Holy Spirit convicts them. Now, I think that some of you brothers and sisters have not been as firm, I think, as Jesus would be in asking people to do things and in sharing it. I think in every apartment you ought to have what we have in our houses, a family meeting, where you do share what's happening but you share it as a matter of information. It's the difference in, between good advertising and bad. Good advertising is information. Bad advertising, at least for Christians, is motivation. We trust the Holy Spirit to motivate. It's the same with informing. Are you informing them of the situation? And it seems to me a family meeting in an apartment or a house is a beautiful time to talk about tendencies and trends. But you don't motivate them by your information. Yeah. So that's it. But I think we have responsibility to inform by asking them to do things after they refuse, that's something that the Holy Spirit alone can deal with. And he can only deal with it if we come into real love without reservation. That's right, that's right. The old martyr spirit, and, and that, that, just, that just intensifies the whole strife between you. And that's how Satan complicates our relationships with each other. Yeah. He gets us to do what we've asked each other to do, but we do it in a bad spirit, and yet somehow we don't always sense it's a bad spirit, so we begin to misinterpret and misunderstand each other. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dear ones, it is worth going down in the dirt every time. No question. The other achieves nothing. We think it does. It achieves nothing. You all would testify to it. How many of us have been involved in family fights? And it's all over this thing that we feel if we tell them and tell them strongly enough, they're going to do it. The spirit is wrong within them. That's what's wrong. And only the Holy Spirit can deal with that spirit. And he can only deal with it if our spirit is right. So our first task is to get our spirit right. And God can give you a right spirit what, however unjustly you're being treated. He can give you the same spirit as he gave to Jesus on the cross. Father, we really do ask you, by your Holy Spirit, to make these things real in each one of our lives. Because, Father, we see that these are the things that spoil our home lives and spoil the lives in our dorms and in our houses and our apartments. So, Father, we want to come into this. It seems at times such a hard way but Father we know the other way has been no use and so we would trust you to teach us how to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive to you in Christ Jesus 
and teach us how to let sin not reign in our mortal bodies. Teach us not to provide for sin, but teach us to start living our lives providing for the infinite patience and power of Jesus to be manifested in us. Trust you, Father, that we will, in fact, attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. We trust you, Holy Spirit, to lead each one of us in this by revelation during this coming week for your glory. Amen.